Greetings. I'm Vern Sampano. This is the Word of Faith Ministries International Miami Teaching of the Week. Let's pray. Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word. As we empty ourselves, vessels for your use, and yield now to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, the saints say in agreement. Amen. Satan, we bind you, all unholy seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, territorials, elementals, strong man spirits on assignment, all above, around, and below the strong man spirits, all familiars, ancestrals, elementals, and disembodied spirits and entities not of the Holy Spirit. All of their works and efforts which we bind, curse at the roots and cast down. And bind up and off all retaliations, counterattacks, judgment, wrath, revenge, or reprisals of Satan in any way, manner, or form, to or through any individual organization, adversary, or would-be adversary, past, present, even as they arise, or to or through anyone, anywhere, at any time, in any manner, for any reason, by any means, for any purpose, in any way and decree all such immediately, permanently, and perpetually forbidden, and bind them up and off from doing so immediately, permanently, and perpetually, all by the faith of God in Christ Jesus' name, and the saints say in agreement, amen. We continue our teaching on becoming unto completion. The New Testament scripture says you are complete in him. Complete in him. Everything in the kingdom of God that we need or that we desire, we must take possession of. There are laws of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is granted by grace. The kingdom is taken possession of by faith. The kingdom is demonstrated by action. So if you want to see a manifestation of the kingdom, you must take an action first. So if you want an answer to prayer, you must pray first. If you want to see prophecy fulfilled, you must prophesy first. If you want to see a healing, you must lay hands first. The kingdom is demonstrated by action. And the fourth law of the kingdom is the kingdom operates by revelation. Revelation. And so, we have been speaking in particular of appropriating, taking possession of those things that bring us to completion in Christ. Now, you say, wait a minute, Bern. The scripture says, I am complete in him, right? Right. That refers to your spirit man. Your spirit man is immediately and completely perfected. We're going to talk more about that shortly. Okay. However, in Philippians 1 6, we read, He who has begun a good work in you is able to bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus, which is either the day of the rapture or the day of your personal rapture, your death. God brings your soul man to completion. So one refers to the spirit man, he's complete. The soul man is in the process of being saved or complete. Uh, that's uh, Romans 12, 2. Be you transformed by the renewal of your mind. Your mind, will, and emotions is your soul, suke in the Greek of the New Testament. And so we learn that uh, we are complete in the spirit we are being completed in the soul. Uh, and of course, our physical man will be completed at the resurrection. Now, the important thing to understand is this. In John 3, 6, Jesus said, the things of the spirit are spirit and the things of the flesh are flesh. Now, what that simply means is that as long as the things of the Spirit are Spirit, we have access to the things of the Spirit, 
because Scripture says we are complete in Him. And so over the past few sessions, uh, we uh, began a discussion on third heaven authority and position, and it's particularly its relationship to spiritual warfare, and uh, how to access the third heaven. And why would you want to access the third heaven? Well, number one, God is there. That ought to be fun. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jesus is there, huh? The Holy Spirit is there. Uh, New Jerusalem is there. The cloud of witnesses are there. Huh? Heaven's a busy place. And however, in Ephesians 2, 6, we read, you are seated in heavenly places. Now, I would point out to you that the verb in the Greek there is present tense. You are seated in heavenly places. And you might say, how did I get there? I don't remember going there. How did that happen? Well, the answer to that is it happened when you got born again. We'll do a quick review of that momentarily, uh, because uh, I know that there aren't many uh, churches or uh, uh, home churches or religious organizations out there that preach third heaven authority or third heaven realm or third heaven access. And to many, many people, this is sort of a new teaching. It's not a new teaching. The teaching is over 2,000 years old. Now, you can always tell when a teaching is scriptural because uh, you will not only find it in the New Testament, but you will find it in type or representation in the Old Testament. And I will show that to you momentarily. But when we get into things like this, uh, there are those who sometimes stumble because of the newness to them of what uh, a teaching like this is. Uh, so we, over the last two sessions, uh, spent some time showing you that there are other proofs that there, of the reality of these things. One of the proofs is quantum physics. And we spent this uh, one or two sessions on quantum phys physics showing what uh, scientists who study uh, the physics of light uh, have discovered about light and have discovered about uh, the meaning of light and how closely re related it is to the scripture. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's why. And he said, you are the light of the world, the believer. You are the light of the world. And in the Greek, the word for light is phos, P-H-O-S. And the literal meaning of it in English is uh, physical light. The stuff that's shining on me right now. Uh, is uh, what the scripture is talking about. And we know that there is a relationship between light and life, isn't there? And uh, that's the study of quantum physics, the study of the physics of light. And we went through in our last videos, you can uh, uh, go to our archives. Uh, uh, on YouTube and look at those last videos where I show you the quantum physics uh, discoveries of physicists and how close it is to scripture and many of the things the scripture was talking about 2,000 years ago and the physicists are trying to figure it out today. Isn't that something? Okay. Einstein, for one, and Hawking's, two of the great uh, uh, quantum physics minds of our day, uh, were both looking, as I'm sure other physicists were,
for a unified field theory of uh, physics that would explain everything. Uh, uh, Hawking's referred to it as the theory of everything. Well, all they had to do was look in the Bible because it says all things were made through him. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see, so what is the problem? They're looking for a physical law that can explain everything. It, folks, if you're a physicist, let me tell you something. You're not looking for a law. You're looking for a person. And his name is Christ Jesus. He's the explanation of everything. He created. All things were made through him, the scripture says. And so, uh, as we got uh, gathered evidence to prove that uh, all of what is being taught is in the word of God, we continue our teaching and we move into the uh, study of uh, the third heaven realm, the third heaven authority, uh, and what it means, what it represents. And we want to talk today about realization of access, how you can realize the access and have confident in what the scripture says about access to God and the things of God, that we can have the confidence to step out in faith and start walking in the third heaven at the same time that we are on the earth. And I will prove to you today that that is possible because I, as we said in our last sessions, it's always, it's also been proven in quantum physics that uh, a person can be in two places, or light uh, particles can be two places, the same light particles at the same time. Not only that, it's been uh, proven in uh, quantum physics with uh, electrons around atoms, that they can be in two places at the same time. It's part of physical law. It's been proven with subatomic particles such as neutrinos and uh, quarks. And uh, so uh, it's very interesting to know why, because Christ is the creator, huh? He's the creator of this stuff. So we learn that uh, what he said about the creation was true. He said I have made myself known through my creation. See? So we're going to look into this a little further now. As we talk, you have to be aware that religious folks are always with us. And uh, so uh, one of my... Uh, and they will, and, and many of them uh, don't understand or desire the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit of God, uh, having access to third heaven authority, and things like that. And so they will be among the first sometimes uh, to go on the attack and to criticize these things as being imagination, fantasy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, Jesus had to contend with that also, huh, in his day. And what did he say? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't go uh, by what people say when they oppose the truth of the Word of God. Stick by the truth of the Word of God, and the rule of every Bible translator and Bible scholar regardless of the division of Christianity it's in, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Protestant, whether it's Orthodox or Independent, all of the scholars agree on one thing. Scripture interprets Scripture, not people. Scripture interprets Scripture, and the Spirit of God gives you the revelation. Say. So don't let people put this stuff down to you and convince you this is dangerous teaching. That, if it weren't for ignorance, would come 
a hair's breadth away from blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You think about that. So, uh, no, it isn't. So whenever we teach things like this, we use Scripture to interpret Scripture because Scripture says that it's authored by the Holy Spirit. God is not a man that he should lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. Right? So, uh, having said that, let's look now at realization of access of third heaven uh, reality, of third heaven uh, authority and position. In Colossians 3, verse 1 to 3, we read, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. You have died. Did you know you died? When did you die? You died the day you got born again. It's speaking here of the old self, the old man. You see, you have died, and in water baptism by immersion, you were you entered into Christ's death, and you were buried with him, it says. And when you rose up out of the water, you rose up a new creation. And what does that mean? It says in the scripture, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And so the scripture sets the uh, tone, the mood for which we are to approach uh, realization of access to the third heaven. And what does it say? Set your minds on things above. Now, your mind is your soul. Your soul is not yet saved. Say, But it's not going to get saved by setting your mind, your soul, on things on the earth, is it? Why? The earth is perishing. So if you do that, and you go along with it, and you enjoy the things of the earth, I'm talking about the naughty things of the earth, huh? I mean, there's a lot of things in the earth uh, that uh, God created for us and for our pleasure, and they're good, right? It isn't that the earth is evil. It's that the earth has evil in it, right? But not all of the earth is evil. God has given us that as a gift to enjoy, right? But we are to possess those things which are righteous and good and holy on the earth, and we are to reject those things which are evil and degrading and uh, corruptive. Okay? So when we talk about realization of access, the question we want to ask firstly is this. Is it prefigured in Old Testament Scripture? And the answer to that is, yes, it is. And so we turn to Zechariah chapter 3. And if you have your scriptures with you, read along with me, but I'll read it to you. And here's what it says, beginning with verse 1 to 7. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Speaking of Joshua the high priest. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. Now, notice that the term angel is used here. In the Old Testament, 
the pre-incarnate Jesus, the Holy Spirit, appeared in several different forms. In Joshua, he appeared at Jericho as the captain of the host. Uh, in several other locations in the Old Testament, he was referred to as the angel of the Lord. And when you hear that term, the angel of the Lord, it refers to the pre-incarnate Jesus, the Holy Spirit on the earth at that time. So the angel here, who is cleansing Joshua the high priest, the filthy garments refers to his iniquities, his sins, both generational or personal. Okay? And the filthy raiments, what he is uh, clothed or cloaked in, the angel of the Lord removes from him, and uh, he causes his iniquity to pass from him, it says. And then he says, I will clothe you with a change of raiment. Now, this in typology or representation of types or things to come reflects upon uh, Revelations chapter 3, where uh, uh, God says to the church of Laodicea, uh, get... Uh, uh, oil, he says. In other words, they didn't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They were lukewarm. He says, you're not hot, you're not cold. If Because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then he tells them to repent, that they may take on the garment of righteousness, hmm? the white robe of righteousness the white robe of righteousness. That's what is being prefigured here in Joshua 4 when he says, I will clothe you with a change of raiment, a change of garments. When we get born again, our spirit man is cleansed of all sin, and we are cloaked. Our spirit man is cloaked in a white robe of righteousness, the scripture tells us. White raiment. Meaning that we are saved, we are sinless. We have right, the God of the righteousness of God. Righteousness comes from an old English term, uh, craw, uh, I'm sorry, called uh, white, an old English term called right wiseness. Sounds like I got marbles in my mouth. <laughs> White, did it again. Right wiseness. <laughs> and that's old English. Right wiseness means right standing with God. The word righteousness means right standing with God. Okay? And so. He goes on to say, and I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. Well, what do we get? We get a crown of righteousness, don't we? Okay, see, this is Old Testament type of things to come. So they set a fair mitre on his head and clothed him with garments. In other words, he took on a new mantle. Okay, what happens when you get born again? You take on a new mantle, don't you? Okay. And uh, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and shall also keep my courts. Where are God's courts? Third heaven. Huh? See? He's telling a man on the earth, a lover of God, a high priest, that if he obeys 
his words, his commandments, which means his teachings, huh? that he will give him the, the anointing, the empowerment to keep charge of the things of God, number one, to two, to judge from the house of God, or in the house of God, and two, to watch over and keep his courts, and then watch this. And I will give you places to walk among these things. These things are all in the third heaven. I will give you places to walk among these things that stand by. So here we see in the Old Testament a prefiguring of the reality of what God will do for the believer in the New Testament. See? So it says in Romans 8.30, moreover, whom he predestined, that's speaking of us, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Wow. Now, here is something that's uh, rarely uh, realized. When it says in Ephesians 2.6, you are seated in heavenly places, that's speaking of your spirit man. And few people realize this. How could you be seated in seven, I'm sorry, in heavenly places? How could you? How could you be seated? in heavenly places if your spirit man isn't already glorified. Huh? When did your spirit man get glorified? When you got born again. When you got born again. How do you know? That's when you got the DNA of God. That's when you became a son of God. At the moment, you got born again. And guess what? That was the moment that you and I were seated in heavenly places. It was immediate. Why? Because Christ entered you. And where Christ entered you, there can be no evil. Your spirit man is immediately and completely perfected and saved and sanctified anew. Old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. And so you are now called a new creation. A new creation. Wow. That means that now you receive the promises of God. One of the promises of God that Jesus gave us was in John 14, 12. The things I do, you will do, and greater things than these shall you do, for I go to the Father. Do you dare to believe that? Do you dare to receive that? Do you dare to walk in it? Because it's true. God is not a man that he should lie. So let's look at this a little closer. So we go back to John 3. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus has engaged uh, a Pharisee, uh, who a lover of God, who uh, was not like other Pharisees. Uh, and he was very interested in Jesus and the things he was teaching. And he came to Jesus to talk to him. And Jesus said a very interesting thing. He said to him, 
unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus turns to Jesus. I'm paraphrasing for the sake of time. Uh, uh, he uh, turns to Jesus and he says, how can I return to my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says a very interesting thing to him. He says, uh, Nicodemus, uh, how is it that you, the greatest scholar of Israel, do not understand spiritual things? Could you imagine? And so he goes on in verse 6 to say to him, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In verse 7, he says, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. And in verse 8, he says a very amazing thing. He says, the wind blows where it lists, where it will. And you hear the sound thereof, but you, can't t you cannot tell from where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Wind in Scripture and breath are equated with the Holy Spirit, as you know in the study of typology or representations, types. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? In verse 10, Jesus says, Are you a master of Israel and know not these things? Truly, truly, I say unto you, We speak that we do know, and testify we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly, heavenly things? <clears throat> and then comes the most mind-blowing remark of chapter 3. Jesus says to Nicodemus, as he's standing there in front of him, and no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus is standing in front of Nicodemus, face to face, and he's saying to Nicodemus, at the same time I'm here, I'm in heaven. I'm in two places at one time. Now, let's go back to John 14, 12. Jesus says, the things I do, you will do. And greater things than these things shall you do. How will you do that? You'll do it by the empowerment of Christ who who got you born again and seated you there at the time you were born again. So your spirit, man, is in heavenly places at the same time your spirit, man, is here on earth. It's a matter of divine revelation. It's a matter of Scripture. And Scripture cannot contradict scripture. So, we learn here something of great interest. And then the next question we have to ask is, how did this occur? Well, it occurred, uh, the answer to that is in John 3, verse 3. Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that word born again is a rather loose translation of the verb uh, in the Greek, uh, the Greek verb geneo. 
And Janeo literally means to be generated out of. Some of your translations say, unless you are born from above. Well, that's a little closer. Born again is a loose expression. Born from above is a little closer. But the literal Greek from uh, manuscripts from which the translations are made says uh, generated out of. And that's the old English uh, word begotten. So in John chapter 1, uh, where it speaks of Jesus in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, with God, and the Word was God, etc. It goes on to say, He was begotten of the Father. Now, in Old English, the word begotten means generated out of. It's the equivalent of the Greek verb geneo. See? So the King James translators. Uh, we're trying to get an exact translation from the Greek to the English, and they did a pretty good job with that. So we see that verb again used in John 3, 3 in regard to us being born again, and we realize that as Christ was generated out of the Father, we were generated out of Christ when we got born again and invited Christ into our hearts. It's an affair of the heart. And so when we did that, what happened? One, we immediately became a son of God. Why? Because we immediately receive the DNA of God. And when we receive the DNA of God, we became one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6.17 He who is Christ is one spirit. Now that's very important because 2 Peter tells us that we have partaken in his divine nature. Isn't that something? I think it's 2 Peter 1, if I remember. Uh, we have now partaken of his divine nature. We have the spark of God in us. Jesus says, is it not written that you are gods with a small g? You are not God with a capital G. huh? You are not Jesus. You are not the Holy Spirit, but you are a God with a small g because you have the spark of God, a spark of God in you that is a... Uh, uh, part of the divine nature in you to equip you to do the works of God, to do the things of God, to know God, right? You well, Listen to it. Uh, let me explain it sort of this way. To know God, you have to perceive and know the nature of God. You have to have some of his nature in you, don't you? Otherwise, how could you understand that, right? If an ant was crawling along and he saw you and he looked at you, could he understand the nature of being human? No. To understand the nature or the essence of being human, he would have to have part of that essence in him, right? See? So there would be only one way to understand uh, how, you know, uh, what it means, uh, you know, to be human, and that would, for it to become one, if that were possible. See? And by the way, 
That's the reason why Jesus came in the form of a man. See? God had already explained why. In the scripture, he had said, as far as the heavens are above the earth, as far uh, are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. In other words, you would not be able to understand me. See? So the Father, Scripture says, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And it says he came in the likeness of a man. And he set his divine nature aside. And everything he did on the earth, he did through the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit using miracles, the gift of miracles one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, as a result, we can understand him, and from what he teaches, we can understand God. And so, here is what he did. And it's just amazing. He gets us born again. He puts in us part of the divine nature according to 2 Peter 1. He uh, releases in us the DNA of God. And you say, well, God doesn't have DNA. Oh, really? God doesn't have DNA? Then let me ask you a question. How did Mary get pregnant? Can you explain that to me? And how did she have a male child? Because women don't have a Y chromosome. Where did it come from? Generated from the Holy Spirit. See? Along with the divine nature that was put in uh, Jesus. Or generated out of the Father. I should say. Say, How about John? His mother was too old to bear a child. And his father, the scripture says, was beyond his years. So how was John the Baptist birthed? By the Spirit. And the DNA of God. And then God did that to you. And he did that to me. Now that's amazing. Okay. Why else is it amazing? We just read here in uh, Colossians 3 that we had died with Christ. Huh? Why had we died and why did we need to die uh, and get buried? Our old man our old spirit man had to be regenerated anew because when we were walking around unsaved, our spirit man was dead. See? We couldn't know God. When you were unsaved, who was ever thinking about God? No one was thinking about God, right? We were thinking about what kind of mischief we could get into. Huh? Chasing after the things of the world as the world kept chasing after us. Okay? Keeping you distracted from God. Huh? <laughs> Very clever, Satan. <laughs> yes. But God. But God. Now, We take on the divine nature. We take on the DNA of God. We take on uh, the new man, the new creation. God seats us in heavenly places. And now, 
he positions us to realize how to access these things and how to uh, operate in them. In Luke 16, 16, Jesus said a very interesting thing. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. What is he saying there? First thing he's saying is, that's over with. It's put aside, it's fulfilled in Christ. Does that mean, uh, and, and some people wrongly teach that uh, the law, Old Testament law, uh, is no longer. That's not true. The scripture does not say the Old Testament law is over with. That's wrong teaching. The scripture says the Old Testament law is fulfilled in Christ. And I hear I hear pastors and evangelists and things like that say over and over again to the people sometimes, uh, no, the Old Testament law is done away with, and now we are walking by grace through faith. Well, that's honest. We are walking by grace through faith. However, however, that doesn't mean that Old Testament law is put away with the scripture says very clearly in no uncertain terms that the Old Testament law is fulfilled in Christ. It's witnessed to us, our conscience bearing witness. So do we obey it by self effort? No. We obey it by Christ living his life in us and through us. So it is kept by Christ through us, our conscience bearing witness. This is the right thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. We should obey this. We should not obey that. You see? And by the way, just as a sidelight, let me tell you something. Christ said that. In the scripture, he said, in the New Testament scripture, the word cannot be broken. And some of your translations say the word cannot be divided. What did he mean by that? He meant that Old Testament scripture and New Testament scripture are one unit. Written word of God is all law. The New Testament written word of God is law. And that is the reason why Jesus said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life, but it is they that speak of me, the living word, and you will not come to me that you may have life. Say, in other words, put it in sum and substance, Jesus said, the letter of the word kills. The spirit of the word gives life. He said, you will not come to me that you may have life. Say, you can search the scriptures all you want. And yet, notice what Paul says about the scriptures. He says, the word is holy. The word is righteous. He said, but through it, I came to no sin. He says, and lust birthed sin in me, and sin birthed death. See? So why do we still read? The, the letter of the word, the scriptures, Old Testament and New. The reason we read it is because as we read it, the Holy Spirit is able to make certain things that he wants us to know jump off of the page and get into us, and he changes the written word into rhema, rhema revelation. 
See, and that's what gives life. That's the first reason. The second reason is because it shows us God's standard, which we cannot keep, which drives us to Jesus. See? Listen, Jesus has everything rigged. <laughs> he's got everything rigged. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. I promise you, he hasn't forgotten a thing. He's dotted every I and crossed every T. Just like the Old Testament scribes. Okay? Now watch this. Let's get back to the word. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Now watch this. Because I'm going to ask you a question. Now the kingdom is preached, and many there are who are pressing in, pressing in, pressing in. My question is, are you caught up in Christian religion, or are you pressing into the kingdom? That's a great question, isn't it? Because a lot of the man-made churches who deny the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, etc., and who criticize uh, things of the Spirit because they don't understand it. It isn't open to them because they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. And some of them even play down the born-again experience, don't they? Right? So what happens here? Are they um, uh, saved? Some of them are. Some of them are not. That's up to God, not me to decide. But I can tell you this. Unless you're born again and spirit-filled, you cannot access the kingdom of God. And that's another verse, John 3, 5, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, born of water has a double representation in typology or study of types. Firstly, uh, it has a cultural representation. He was speaking to a Jew. Okay. And when he said, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water, born of water was a Hebrew idiom. Uh, and that was referred to women who were giving birth. And when the bag of waters broke, they said that the infant was born of water. That was a way of saying the delivery had begun. Okay. Born of water has a second in type, has a second representation. And that is water baptism by immersion, where you are put in the death work of the cross or your spirit, soul, and body are put in the death work of the cross and you rise up out of the water a new birth, a new creation. See, sometimes prophetic uh, uh, scriptures have multiple meanings. See, I'll give you another quick example of that. If you go and you read in the book of Revelation, uh, the judgment of the seven churches of Asia in chapters two and three. These were seven literal churches that Jesus addressed. And he gave to each of them a commendation and a warning. Okay. But if you understand that the book of Revelation is a prophetic writing, then what you will understand then is prophetic writings can have multiple meanings. And that is a perfect example, because not only were those seven churches, seven literal churches, 
but they also represented seven church ages that uh, the uh, church went through in history, and they also represent seven conditions of the end-time church at large. See? And all three meanings are correct. See? Well. So the question is, now the kingdom of God is preached, and... Many there are who are pressing in. Pressing in. Does that not mean that we should be pressing into kingdom things? Is not third heaven authority, third heaven realm? And uh, what you do in the third heaven, a thing of the kingdom. Of course it is. Of course it is. Why in the world would God have you seated in heavenly places if it wasn't for a purpose? Huh? So, Ephesians 2 6 reads, And he raised us up with him, with him. When he resurrected from the dead, positionally, you were resurrected from the dead. Did you know that he knew you by name before the creation of the world? That's 4.5 billion years ago. Called you by name 4.5 billion years ago. I mean, do you know who you're dealing with here? <laughs> okay. And then in time, 2,000 years ago, he pays the price for all sin. But did it really happen 2,000 years ago? No. When did the payment of the price for all sin occur? According to the word of God, before the creation of the world. The scripture says the lamb was slain before the creation of the world. Does this stuff boggle the mind? Okay. The decision was made. And he did it 2000, or about 2,000 years ago. Okay. And at that time, he raised us up with him. When Christ was resurrected from the dead, you and I, our spirit man that was dead, was resurrected from the dead. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. That's what the Word of God says. You are not your body. You are a spirit. That's your identity. You are first and foremost a son of God. That's your identity. Let's talk about identity. Because identity is an important part of this realization and in, in operating in access. Okay? If you're into churchianity, or uh, churchy churches as I call them, uh, and that's not meant to be uh, derogatory. It's just meant to point out something, that people make church out of the Christian faith. And the Christian faith has nothing to do with church. The word church really isn't in the Bible. Did you know that? That was... Uh, a literary license of Jerome and Augustine, the two early Catholic uh, Bible translators who wrote the uh, early Catholic uh, Bible called the Latin Vulgate. And they used the word church. Why? Because they had established a church and they wanted it to refer to their church, say, the Roman church. Okay? But in the Greek, 
The word ecclesia doesn't mean church. Let's get our doctrine straight. It means the called out ones. The called out ones into Christ. It means the assembly. It means uh, the congregation. That's what it means. So, if we understand that the Christian faith is not a religion, the Christian faith is a confession, and it is a confession on a person, and his name is Christ Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. So, in Ephesians 2.6, we're talking about realiza realization of access to the third heaven. It says, you are seated in heavenly places. Now notice, it begins, he raised us up with him. That's past tense. Past tense. Raised us up. And then, and seated us. Past tense. In other words, it happened at the resurrection. I mean, at, at the death on the cross when our salvation was made complete. Our spirit man immediately regenerated anew, plopped on our seat in the heavenly places, crown put on our head. Hallelujah. And then, in Revelations 1.6, he announces to the world, you are a king and priest unto your God. He gives us a kingship. He gives us a priesthood. What is the priesthood? The priesthood of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Hebrew. Melchi, uh, uh, Zedek. Melchi Zedek. Okay. Translation, righteous priest king. Righteous priest king. Okay? And, of course, in Hebrews, we see that he has the titles king of righteousness, king of glory. Those are not titles for any human being. No man has the title or, or has the worthiness to be called king of righteousness, king of glory. That is referred to the Godhead. In Hebrews 7, it says that Melchizedek was uh, made in the similitude of Christ. In other words, uh, that's talking about uh, his appearance. It is not, he is not Christ, as many teach. Melchizedek is Christ. No, the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says he is in the likeness of Christ. Okay? And he has, and he is the only part of the Godhead who has been on the earth since the creation. In Genesis 14, he gave Abraham the victory in the battle of the five kings. And Abraham came with a tithe of the tenth of the spoils. And he bowed down and worshipped him in thanksgiving for giving him the victory. Only God can give you the victory over men. Huh? This was the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, so, uh, the tithe, and by the way, according to first mentioned principle in scripture, when something's mentioned for the first time, that meaning usually sticks anytime it's mentioned after that throughout the Word of God. Okay? And so notice what the purpose of the tithe was. Worship. Say, 
And there are people today that are teaching, you don't have to pass the tithe. You don't have to uh, pay the tithe. That's Old Testament. That's done away with. False. False. How do you know? That's not how it works. When something is changed from Old Testament to New Testament, the New Testament tells you. When something is not changed from Old Testament to New Testament, it passes through unchanged. And we see Jesus and the apostles tithing in the New Testament. The tithe passes through unchanged. Okay? And not only that, I've heard people teach on the tithe that uh, it's done away with because that was under the law. No, the tithe preceded the law. It was already in existence before the law. And its purpose was to worship God and honor God the Holy Spirit. Say, we've got to get our doctrines straight. The end time church is apostate. That means it's fallen away from the truths of the, the uh, word of God as originally intended when it was written by the Spirit. Okay, let's see if we can get through this Ephesians 2 6. So he raised us up, past tense, seated us with him in heavenly places. Notice it doesn't say a heavenly place. It says heavenly places. This probably means in multiple dimensions. Say. The other thing it could mean, as we said in our previous uh, teaching on, in uh, the quantum reality of Scripture, uh, is uh, it could mean... Uh, uh, other universes, multiple universes. Uh, and I prove to you that if you understand that the scripture is written in the language of 2,000 years ago, where they didn't have the vocabulary to express things that we have today, you could spot the multiverse throughout the Old Testament. Okay? And it was referred to as the heavens and the heavens of the heavens. What do you think that means? The universe and the universes of the universes. That's what it means. So the multiverse uh, is in Scripture. Okay? Now, uh, if you want to read more, just go, I mean, know more about that, just go to our previous two videos. Uh, anyway, Uh, notice now, it says, He seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He didn't seat us in the heavenly places, period. He seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why in Christ Jesus? Well, very simple. Book of Acts tells us in him we live and move and have our being. So in the heavenly places, our spirit man would not be able to function on its own as long as our soul man and our physical man are still in their bodies. See? But our spirit man is perfected for a purpose. And that is to know the Father. And that is to be blessed as heirs of the kingdom. We are heirs. We are sons of God. We have a right to the things of the kingdom. God is righteous. He cannot deny himself. So he gives us a position in Christ there and a position in Christ here on the earth. Say, and we are seated in heavenly places. Where are we seated in heavenly places? Well, if you're a king and a priest, 
unto your God, you're seated on a throne. And where is your throne? In heavenly places. Well, the scripture infers we will be sitting sitting at the right hand uh, of uh, God. Nor, could you bring me some uh, grape juice? Yeah. Seated at the right hand uh, of God. Say, of Christ, actually. Okay. Now watch this. You are there. I you, People say, how do I get there? You don't get there. You are there. Thank you. You don't get there. You are there. It's not how do I get there. You are in the earthly dimension at the same time in the heavenly dimension, just like Jesus said to Nicodemus. He's standing there in front of him. And he says, uh, no one has descended to the earth and ascended to the heaven, but the Son of Man who is seated in the heavens. Now he's saying the same things. You see, this is the truth and the genuine reality of the Word of God. When in John 14, 12, he says, the things I do, you can do them greater. For I go to the Father. Say, that's his faithfulness to us. So to realize the heavenly dimension in you and access it, you must simply step into it by faith on Christ and faith confess the experience. Okay? Now, to do that, you've got to have a right identity. Okay? If you're in a, a religious church and you've been taught over and over and over again uh, that uh, you are... Uh, only a sinner saved by faith. Don't try to get into the third heaven reality uh, because you won't. If that's your identity, that's a wrong identity. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Ho hum. Say. That will keep you earthbound, and it will also keep you in error. Why? Because the book of Romans tells you your true identity. And in the book of Romans, it says, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You have a new mantle on you. You have a new mantle. Christ put that on you when you got born again. See, let me say something to you that you've got to understand uh, really to get on with God. Excuse me, I'm thirsty. <laughs> you are not your past. You are not the bad things that you did. You are not the person of low self-esteem or self-hate or anything else like that that disturbs your image that God has of you. God sees you as the finished product. God isn't thinking about your sins. He, he dealt with that 2,000 years ago. He put it in the death work of the cross. He's not thinking about what you did or what your sins were. He sees you as a son.
He sees you as the righteousness of God in Christ. That's God's image of you. If you look at the past, you're not going to be able to enter third heaven authority. You're not going to be able to access the throne. You must leave your past behind. It's over with. Forget it. That was buried with you in the waters of immersion baptism. Put in the grave with the old man. You must leave your problems behind. You must leave your fears behind. You must leave your doubts behind. You must leave double-mindedness behind. And you must trust. And when you have faith, which is trust on Christ, you must combine it with a holy expectation. Mm. See, you're there already, and you're here. Because Jesus said he is there in here. And you are one spirit with his spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.17 That's why you are born again. See, you can seek the things that are above and experience them because you were generated out of Christ and have the DNA of God in you, a new creation, born of the Spirit of God, a Son of God. Therefore, you have third heaven authority and anointing with which to be seated in heavenly places. Now watch this. In 2 Peter 1.4 we read, Through these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust. Because of his precious and magnificent promises, we may become partakers of the divine nature. This is what permits us to do this. And so in John 15, 3, we read... Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That's Jesus. Christ. Let's go on to um, Ephesians uh, uh, 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us, that has made us alive, that's Old English, made us alive, together with Christ, by grace you're saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is another verse that tells us we're seated in heavenly places.
He quickened us together with Christ. Raised us up together. In other words, when Christ was resurrected, our spirit man was resurrected with him. It's positional. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, understand that realization to access to the third heaven is through faith on Christ. Through faith on Christ. Let's, let's just read this, Ephesians 3, 8 to 12. And this is Paul speaking, and he says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That should really read, so that through the called out ones, through the called out ones, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So how do we get into the third heaven? With boldness and access through faith. And that is confirmed by Hebrews 4.12, where it says, Come boldly to the throne of grace that you might receive mercy and compassion in your time of need. And where is the throne of grace? It's in the third heaven. It's in the third heaven throne room. See? So the scripture is telling us, don't be timid. Don't be dwelling on a false identity. Okay? You're not worthy. Uh, you've sinned too much. Um, God can't possibly use me for that. Oh, yes, he can, and he's already done it. He's just waiting for you to move. Say, step out in faith. Apply the word of God. Watch it work. See? So, 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Where's his marvelous light? Not only here, but even more so in the heavenly realm, isn't it? You're called there. That's what the word of God is saying. You're called there. So Romans 8, 16 and 17 tells us, it's the Spirit himself that bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children heirs, and if heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Well, I think we've all had suffering of some sort of another, right? And God sees to it that we do, because in heaven he has a book of life on us. Okay? In the library of heaven, there is a book of life for each and every person that Jesus wrote personally. Things he wants us to experience. And then, our assurance of uh, access 
is no, noted in Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Are you led by the Spirit of God? Then you're a son of God. How will you know when you're positioned in third heaven, in the third heaven realm? Say you're seated on your throne, your spirit man is. Okay. Now you step into that uh, realization. I'm seated there at the same time I'm seated here. And we're going to, we'll talk uh, uh, on this uh, in our next session on how to uh, realize that uh, actual experience. How will you know what to do, what to say? Well, Romans 8.16 says, His Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are the sons of God, right? And if we are the sons of God, God will talk with us, won't he? He'll speak to us. And if he'll speak to us, we will know that it is he who is speaking. So in Revelations 1.16, watch this now. It's an important principle. It says of Christ, and this is John speaking when he saw him. He said, in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. <clears throat> now, uh, let me just uh, stop there for a moment and address the words, a sharp two-edged sword. The original Greek, from, the trans uh, from which the translations are made, does not say, a sharp two-edged sword. It says a sharp double-mouthed sword. Now try to follow this. Scripture interprets Scripture. Okay? A sharp double-mouthed sword. So, Christ's mouth is the first mouth. He speaks it to us. And then the second mouth is Christ speaking it through us, right? We yield to his Holy Spirit, right? Uh, uh, whenever uh, we are going to be one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. So we are... Uh, yielding to the Holy Spirit. We hear what he says. He witnesses it to us. We speak it as the second mouth of the double mouth sword, which is literally Christ speaking it in us and through us because the verse says out of his mouth comes the double mouth sword. His mouth. Okay, now why is this important? It's important because when you are positioned that way, whether uh, he's using uh, you to speak for him here on earth in the first heaven, or whether it's something that uh, you speak or pray down upon uh, the earth from the second heaven, it doesn't matter. The point is that he is the one doing it. And when you're the second mouth and you know that he is the one speaking to you, and now you speak it, you have to release it verbally, audibly. Why? Words are spiritual. And when they are released, they find their target. Say. And when the target reaches the person or place that it is destined to, 
the happening is in the in the words and uh, it's released upon the person or thing the target now in 1 peter 4:11 we understand that whether we are speaking as the second mouth of the double mouth sword or whether we are speaking yielded to the Holy Spirit alone on the earth or whether we are uh, speaking uh, from our uh, third heaven throne position, we are speaking as an oracle of the Father because we are a son of God and an heir to the kingdom. That's why he's got us seated in the third heaven to begin with. Have you figured that out? Because we're an heir of the kingdom. We have an inheritance in Christ. We are the family of God. He wants his family there with him. See? We are heirs to the kingdom. We have a right to the throne room and our third heaven seat. And God sought to that at the moment we got born again. Okay? So listen to what 1 Peter 4.11 says. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Now, Christ says he speaks only what the Father tells him. He speaks to us what the Father tells him. We speak only what Christ tells us. So when you will speak, and we'll be discussing this more shortly, so when you speak from third heaven authority and seat, you must consider all earthly issues and problems as down below. So you speak down from the third heaven. You pray down from the third heaven on these issues or problems. You release words, breakthroughs, solutions, warfare commands, bindings and loosings, healings, deliverances, whatever the Spirit is prompting you, destructions of evil and strongholds. See, this is the beauty of operating and learning uh, to use third heaven authority and position, even in doing spiritual warfare. Why? Because if you're doing first heaven, which is earth, or second heaven, the atmosphere above the earth, uh, spiritual warfare, you are liable to counterattack. You could you risk getting counterattack. So you have to remember to bind up and off all retaliations and counterattacks in the name of Jesus. However, if you're doing it consistently from your third heaven position and authority, guess what? No counterattacks. Why? Because Satan is spiritually dead and defeated by the work of the cross. He has no access totally denied all access to the third heaven. See? That's why we bother to teach this stuff. See? I personally believe that God wants us to know these things to bring us to a higher level of function in the spirit. Huh? 
So before we close, let me just point out a couple things. You are fully equipped for access to the third heaven. Don't let anyone persuade you of anything different. Walk by the Spirit, Paul said, and you will not do the things of the flesh. Huh? Why? Because the Old Testament scripture says, uh, uh, or is it in the New Testament, no flesh will glory in his presence. Scripture says, we rule and reign with him. Scripture says, because of your position, you can release judgments against the enemy. Because you're complete in him. See? When did you get complete in him? When you got born again. Okay? You are an oracle of the Father. You are part of the double-mouthed sword. Your true identity is that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You can enter into worship, even in the third heaven, and guess what happens? It changes things. Your spirit man has already been glorified. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to be seated in the third heaven. See? And that is your true identity, by the way. You're a spirit. That is why you are seated in heavenly places. That is why you can do the things that Jesus does and greater as he leads and empowers. That is why you were generated out of Christ. That is why you are a new creation. That is why old things are passed away. All things are made new. That is why you have already been resurrected from the dead. That is why the things of the Spirit are spirit. That is why you can crush devils. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions. Well, if you do it from the third heaven position, you won't get retaliation. So, in closing out this uh, session, let's, let me just say that third heaven authority is knowing who you are in Christ both by decree and prayer. See, when you need to access third heaven authority, it's a shift from first heaven to third heaven. And how's it done? Job 22, 28 tells you how it's done. It says, decree a thing you will decree a thing, it will be established for you. So you don't even have to worry about how it happens. It will be established for you. By whom? By the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It will be established for you. So I need, if I need to go to third heaven, I need uh, to uh, uh, talk with Jesus or Father and or I want to discuss something with them, or I want to pray from my third heaven position for people intercession, uh, you know, uh, down upon their circumstance, or or whatever the whatever the reason. All I have to do 
is here I am in the first heaven. And all I have to do is say, Father, I decree that I now walk into my third heaven position and realm in Christ Jesus' name. You're there. That's it. It's established for you, the scripture says. See? Now, start. Uh, you can tell the Lord why you're there or, or what you want to do there or to fellowship or to love on him and Father. You know, or you can tell them I, I'm here to do intercession for so and so, or or I'm praying for the needs of the nation or whatever. See. Okay. Okay. Let's stop there for today. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. Why can he say that? Because he states very clearly in the scripture, it's a matter of divine revelation of the Holy Word of God, that he was generated out of the Father for that purpose, to come to man and to tell man about the Father. Because the Father is so great, man would not be able to fathom him, to understand him. So he says, unless you come to know who I am, you will surely perish in your sin. So Jesus has come to give you the free gift of eternal life for the asking. Nothing you or I can do to earn it. He does it not because of what we do or how good we behave. He does it because of who he is. You see, the Christian faith is the only faith that preaches and emphasize, emphasizes that God is a personal God, not an impersonal God. All other religions preach an impersonal God. He created, and now he's off doing what he wants, and he's not involved with man anymore. No, the God of the Christian faith is a loving God who wants to covenant with you, who wants to love on you, who wants to provide for you, who wants to prosper you, and most of all, who wants to reveal himself to you that you may know him. And you can receive him today. And he gives a promise. In the scripture, in the gospel of John, he says, of everyone who will reach out to him, he says, I will manifest myself to them. You will get a direct experience. No religion can do that. Only the Christian faith can do that. Because it's a living faith. It's a faith that gives people life and hope and divine protection. What more could we ask for? And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will receive you with open arms and teach you their ways. Are you ready? Pray this prayer aloud with me now, won't you, being willing to turn from your sin. The Lord Jesus will do all the rest. And just say these words aloud. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. 
Every sinner needs a Savior. I need a Savior. I acknowledge to you that I've sinned. I choose godly repentance. I ask for forgiveness. I receive you now as Lord to lead me through life and Savior to save me from sin, self, and circumstances. I thank you for the free gift of eternal life, which I cannot earn or deserve. But I thank you anyway, and I receive you by a trusting faith on you alone for my salvation. I thank you for the free gift of eternal life, and I bless your name. Come into me now, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, get yourself into a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational congregation. Get water baptized by immersion. Get Holy Spirit baptized by those in the congregation who have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if there are none, go to the New Testament Gospel of Luke chapter 11 and read chapter 11. And pray directly to Father God and ask Father God to baptize you in his Holy Spirit, and he will do so for the asking. And he'll release nine gifts of the Spirit, which will operate as the Holy Spirit wills. And when they, uh, they, when they manifest, you will know that you know that you know what they are. Get into Christian community where they can teach you the Word of God. I promise you, my friends, you'll never again be the same because the proof that Jesus Christ is real is the testimony of changed lives by the millions of those who have received him throughout the centuries. It is self-proof. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for watching. Join us next week at the same time when we'll be continuing our teaching on entering third heaven authority and position. Until then, God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. We want to thank the members of our radio listening audience. You've been listening to the Sunday morning broadcast coming uh, from Word of Faith Ministries International in Miami, Florida, and its teaching of the week. We hope that you'll join us again next week at the same time when we will be continuing our teaching on Third Heaven Authority and Position. Until then, thanks for listening. Have a great week.